Father in heaven, what, what a day that will be, Lord, and to have our days this week interrupted with the thoughts of that day, so good for us, so good for our hearts, our souls, our minds. It reminds us that this day is important, but it's not the most important day. A day will come when we will bow to you in perfect obedience, perfect obedience joyful, happy obedience. Our slavery to you will be seen in its completeness there, not a rebel molecule anywhere in us, and you will get the glory that you deserve as God, our Father, our Savior. In the meantime, in this day, will you draw near to us as we open your Bible And would you, with your words, speak over these frail lives in this weak day and help us to take another step towards you in obedience and in trust, reliance upon your reigning grace, how supreme it is in our lives. We are what we are today by your grace, not by anything we've done. Help us to live under it with a more thorough knowledge a more thorough commitment to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please take your Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter six this morning. Romans chapter six. At the end of chapter five, there were some staggering, hope-filled declarations made about grace the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God. Grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's chapter five, verse 21. That's quite a statement to make. Grace reigns. And some don't believe that. Some are very, very skeptical of that. Some are convinced and even slanderously accuse grace of being soft on sin as it reigns over our lives as believers. And Romans chapter 6 then is the gospel's astounding defense of grace against these slanderous lies. The first defense of grace is found in verses 1 to 14, and the second defense of grace is found in verses 15 to 23. And we've already covered the first defense. You can see it up on the screen. I just have it there for you to refresh your memory. We've covered that first one. The slanderous charge against grace at the beginning of the chapter is based on this faulty notion of grace because grace provides for faith and requires faith only from the ungodly for salvation. Grace is therefore obviously unconcerned with sin. And and Paul, you did say in chapter 5, verse 20, um, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That sounds to me like grace and sin are in some kind of a mutually benefiting relationship. So Paul says in verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue on living in sin like we were before Christ saved us? So that grace will increase or may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still continually live on in it in an unbroken fashion? And so we worded gospel defense, number one, this way, grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. There's no mutually benefiting relationship going on between sin and grace. And today we're ready to introduce the gospel's second defense that's found over in chapter 6, verse 15. But I want to ask you this question first. How well do you know yourself? How well do you know yourself? That may seem like a 
an, an obvious question. Based on how well you know yourself, how would you describe yourself to others? From what you know of yourself, you would describe yourself to another as what? How well do you know yourself? Maybe a related question, coming at it from a little different angle. Who else knows you best? Or just who knows you best? How would that person describe you? Do you think how you would describe you would be the same as the way they would describe you? Well, the one who does know you best is going to describe you this morning. In fact, all of us. And it might be shocking to you in Romans 6, verse 16, how God describes us all there. Some of you will be familiar with this description, but let me just read verses 14 to 19 to kind of give you the bigger paragraph that our verses 15 and 16 sit in. Verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you, believer, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Verse 15, what then? That connects us back to what Paul just said in verse 14 about not being under law, but now being under grace. The huge claim that Paul made about grace in verse 14 is this. The only way to be removed out from under the master called sin is if you get under the reign of grace. If you, by contrast, instead are under the force of law as a power, then sin, which is in partnership with law, will remain master over you. Grace says sin shall not be master over you precisely because you are not under law as a power, but you are under grace as a power. The under law as a power or as a force is a mutually exclusive condition to be in compared to being under the force of grace as a power. That's how he's presenting it in verse 14. You are under the power and the force of one, or the other. And the point of verse 14 is that if you are under the force of law as a power, then sin masters you. Sin is actually not weakened if you try to bring yourself under the power of law. Rather, sin gets intensified in its lordship over you where law as a power has come in. Look at chapter 5, verse 20. Law came in so that not the transgression would go away, so that it would increase, be exasperated. Verse 14 of chapter 6 means also that law as a force then has absolutely no power to change you in your relationship towards sin. So to be under the force of law as a power, it only intensifies sin's authority and authoritarianism, and it leaves you unchanged as a slave under sin. To be under law is to be a slave of sin. That's the point in verse 14. Under grace means to be under the reign of grace as king over your life. 
And we know that from verses 1 to 14, that means that primarily you have been changed towards sin, your relationship to sin. Grace as a power is so strong that it transformed you in your relationship toward the tyrant called sin. And so you, by grace's achievement, by its force, by its power as a reigning force, Believer, you are no longer the same person in the presence of the same sins. That's what Romans has been telling us in chapter 6. Grace can declare. Grace victoriously does declare. Sin shall not be master over you any longer. Why? Well, because grace put you under its force and power to reign, and you are freed from sin's lordship. If you were still under law, you'd still be the same old person in the presence of the same old tyrant. So, you are not under law, but under grace, verse 14. Verse 15, what then? What follows is the second slanderous charge against grace from the skeptic who just heard what Paul said about grace in contrast to law, but he isn't persuaded by the argument at all yet. All he could hear at the end of verse 14 is that the believer is not under law and the skeptic is flipping out. What? He might say. (laughs) Well, do you you know then what's going to happen? Any kind of sin, a, a sin here, a sin there, that'll just keep occurring. That's what happens when you get out from under the force of law. The skeptic claims. Sin just goes unaddressed. That's the twisted concern and lie the grace skeptic believes. The grace skeptic who didn't buy anything of what Paul said for 14 verses is still around. And he still believes that grace as a force of power will be ineffective against this sin here or that sin there in life. There is a fundamental flaw in the mind of the grace skeptic as he thinks about law. He has far too much confidence in its power, its force. He thinks law as a force has a high concern for holiness. He thinks law as a force has a a higher concern for holiness than grace does, never mind the fact that he doesn't know that the law came in or law came in to so that grace or so that transgression would increase, chapter 5, verse 20. So Paul and the gospel make their second defense of grace against the one skeptical of grace, against the one so impressed by the force of law as a power against sin. So the gospel says to the skeptic, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the force of law as a power, but instead we're under the force of grace as a power? Will we just keep committing this sin here and then that sin there whenever it arises? Is law as a forceful power an unrivaled power against sin here and against sin there in the believer? May it never be. By the way, in verse 1 and 2 of the chapter, mentioning of sin there, are we to continue on in sin? Verse 2, how shall we who died to sin still live on in it? There's a continual sense of an unbroken pattern. We are still sinning just exactly like we did before grace came. That's the the charge. But in chapter 6, verse 15, the idea is not that. It's shall we sin here, there? Is that what's going to happen? Because we are under the force and the power of grace, may it never be. That is the strongest repudiation Paul could give. Monstrous is the thought. The thought that the force of law as a power is greater against sin here or there is preposterous. The idea that it rivals grace in the fight against sin here or sin there, that's to be rejected with the greatest intensity possible. So here is how we will word the gospel. Second defense of grace that takes up the last part of the chapter. Gospel defense number two. 
grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. That's what is said in verse 15. And this has some ramifications for us to consider right away. First, law or laws or rules, they order you but do not enable you to do them. Laws rule you, or uh, rules want to order you, but do not enable you to do what they order. Let me give you an example. A, a speed limit sign tells you what the law is, tells you what the legal limit is for your speed. But the sign is not to be broken down into little pieces and shoved into your fuel tank as a source of energy for your car to get you to the right speed. It is not to be attached somehow, taken from the side of the road, brought into your car, and attached to your accelerator so that it can then set the right speed for you. Listen, the the speed limit's a helpful and a good thing. But it's not a fuel source, nor is it your accelerator pedal. Law orders you, but it does not enable you to do what it orders. Laws are like that, spiritually speaking, religiously speaking. Moral rules are helpful. They're good. They can tell you what the standard is for your behavior, but they are not the fuel source. They are not a force or a power to actually empower you to achieve right behavior. We need laws. We need rules. But we were never supposed to rely on them as a force or as a power to make us live at the standard. In fact, law as a force does just the opposite. Remember verse 20? Law came in so that transgression would increase. You get under law and you're in big trouble. Law is a force. And here is the tragic reality for us when we were back in that slab of sinful solidarity with Adam. Remember the illustration, a concrete slab is made up of lots and lots, countless numbers of little pebbles. They are all cemented together. That was us before Christ. We were in solidarity, in sin, with Adam and with one another. Back in that condition, before Christ, we had a morally insane, even morally suicidal relationship with law and sin. Sin and law as a force are in horrible partnership together in those who were in that sinful slab of solidarity with Adam. In our fallenness, in our sinfulness, when it ever, whenever it did cross our mind there that maybe we'd, we would like to distinguish ourselves from the rest, we're not as bad as the rest. Whenever it crossed our minds that we might do that, that we might try to make ourselves look better than the rest so that we don't get judged along with them. This is Romans chapter two. What did we turn to in our sinfulness to distinguish ourselves? The force and the power of law all we had. Give me rules and I'll distinguish myself from the rest with them. I'm not to be judged with the rest of these guys. And yet what was true all along, all law did in that case was multiply my transgressions. And as slaves to sin already, all we achieved in so doing was we just became even more complete slaves of sin. So slaves of sin in the slab of sinful solidarity have only one sinful choice in front of them when they want to sinfully, foolishly attempt to distinguish themselves from the rest of the sinners, and that is a sinful choice that only enslaves them more completely to sin. It is to choose the force of law as a power to try to distinguish themselves. It's suicide. Morally insane. What a hideous relationship law and sin are in together on. There is only one way to be freed from sin. There's only one way to get out from the slab of sinful solidarity with Adam and the rest of the sinful humanity that is there. And it is not to be under gray or under force of the law as a power. It is instead to be what? Under the force of grace as a power. The reign of grace begins with justification through faith alone. 
And then the reign of grace also includes taking that one who believes and uniting that one with Christ in his crucifixion, in his burial, and in his rising from the dead. And that, we are told in chapter 6, by grace, achieves a changed relationship to sin and provides a new life to live to God. We are, verse 11 of chapter 6, dead to sin, but now alive to God. To be under the reign of the force of grace as a power, it is the only way, it is the only way to be freed from the slave hold of sin. To be under the force of law as a power is to still be in the slave chokehold of sin. And so, if to be under law is in no way to be freed from sin as a whole, then to be under law as a force is no way to stop a sin here or there either. In fact, the gospel's point here is that once you leave slavery to sin, you have actually left behind the under law force forever. The old self of Romans 6 4 lived there under the force of law, and he was crucified with Christ. And you, believer, are now under the reign of the force of grace as a power in your life. So there's no going back over to the old self, nor over to that old force of law as a power to that old slavery. And this leads us to verse 16. Let me repeat to you the gospel defense number two. Grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. Therefore, grace is unrivaled power against sin in the believer. And here's the first one we'll tackle today. Grace is unrivaled power against sin in the believer contrasts and clarifies the only two slave categories possible. This is where grace wants to start. There's only two slave categories possible. Verse 16, do you not know? Do you not know? Paul is reasoning for grace's unrivaled power in sanctification from a well-known fact about slavery that all of the Romans would have recognized. This is a self-evident fact regarding slavery. How could anyone not know this? Most certainly they did know this. We all do, and this well-known fact about slavery, it makes the case for grace's unrivaled power as a force against sin here, against sin there, and the believer. What's the fact? Look at verse 16. I'm going to take you to the middle of the verse, and I'm going to show you the main statement, the main clause. In the middle of the verse, you are slaves of the one you obey. That's the fact that everybody knows. You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Whatever you are obeying, you prove your slavery to. That's just the fact of how slavery works. Obedience is the measure of your slavery. It identifies who your master is. We all know that obedience is the central feature, the main ingredient for slavery. The purpose of the slave is to do what he is told to do. Obedience is the key feature. You are slaves of the one you obey. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, some of you are slaves of the one whom you obey. And he doesn't say, many of you are slaves of the one whom you obey. And he doesn't say, you might be a slave of the one whom you obey. Or sometimes you are, you know, a slave of the one whom you obey. He doesn't say any of these things. This is what Romans 6, verse 16 is telling you about yourself. You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Period. How does that happen? When does that occur? When does your obedience to another take place? Well, that's what the first part of the verse is about. Don't you know that... When you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. That's how you are a slave of the one you obey. Now get this. Did you you notice what it said? You go to that one, and you offer not a portion of you to that one. What does it say? 
Do you not know that when you present what? Who? Yourselves. You and your totality. You go to that one and you offer not a piece of you, but you offer the whole of you. You offer offer yourself to that one as a slave. You say, I am in my total self, I am a slave. I'm not part slave and part free man. I am not a part-time slave, but then I'm on my, I'm my own boss the rest of the time. You cannot say that you are a free man at all in any portion of you. You are a slave. And you are a certain kind of total slave. You are one who goes about looking for a master to present yourself to. And you and I, are, we, we're committed slaves because when we present ourselves to someone as slaves, we do it for obedience. We have obedience to offer as slaves. And so when we present the whole of ourselves as slaves to someone, we do it with our obedience in mind. We are offering to get under another. We're offering to get in line under what they want. And that is how it happens that you are slaves of the one you obey. And this is the self-evident fact. Do you not know this? And did you notice that Romans 6 here, the gospel tells you that no one came and kidnapped you and then took you to the slave market and then put you on the block and then sold you into slavery to another, and that's why you're a slave to the one you obey, because you were forced to do it against your will. It didn't say that, did it? No, you and I are self-presenting slaves. That's what the Word of God says. You have obedience to offer, and as a slave, you are willing to present yourself to another with obedience in mind. And when you do that, you, not someone else, you are the slave of the one you obey. There is no victim language here in verse 16 whatsoever. The slavery that you are in today is your choice. It's not a surprise to you you have an explanation for how you got where you are as a slave. You do this to you. Now, keep in mind the kingly reign of grace, believer, how it changed you, and we're gonna come back to that. But we're gonna let this say what it says. And then, there are only two slave options available for self-offering slaves in the world. You are not in a master-owner buffet line that offers countless different masters to go to. This is not the Cheesecake Factory menu of masters. In fact, it is even more simple than the in and out menu, and there are no secret things on the menu. There's only two options here. Option one for you as a human being, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. Option one, verse 16, of sin resulting in death. For this slave, it means you know you are a slave, that you have obedience to offer, and you have willingly stepped up and towards sin to present yourself to sin as the slave of sin. You obey sin. This is the slave who is bent on doing only sin. This slave clings to sin. You sin are my Lord. You are my master. I am a total slave and your slave, and here is my obedience to you. And the result of that slaving to sin is terrifying. Verse 16, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death. That is probably to be taken in its broadest sense. It's not just physical death that is in mind. Slaving under sin, it it expresses, it proves spiritual death and even eventual physical death and inevitably the worst death of all, the second death at the lake of fire that goes on forever and ever. Slaving under sin is inseparably connected to the most drastic of all evidences and proofs, death. Who are these slaves? Slaves. 
I want to take you back into chapter 5 for a moment. Go back to chapter 5, verse 12. This is all of the human race in union, in solidarity with Adam, in sinful solidarity with him, in like that slab of concrete. Every single one of those little pebbles cemented together in sin in Adam. Look at verse 12. Just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men upon which all sinned. Those are the ones who are the slaves of sin resulting in death. Look at verse 14. Death reigned over Adam and until Moses in those early days of solidarity. Look at verse 15. By the transgression of the one, the many died. Look at verse 17, the first part. By the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Some slaves there. Verse 18. Through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Verse 19. Through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, constituted sinners. Look at verse 20. Here's the law as a force. Law came in so that transgression would increase in that slab of solidarity of sin. Verse 21, sin reigned in death. You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or the other option. So who are these? Every single human without the Savior, Jesus Christ. And without his reigning kingly grace. Here is slave option number one for you. Slave option number two for you as a human being. Verse 16 of chapter six. You are slaves of the one you obey. Option two of obedience resulting in righteousness. This is the opposite slave category to slaving under sin, the opposite of obeying sin. So that tells us what kind of obedience is mentioned here. You're either a slave of sin resulting in death or a slave of obedience. It tells us what kind of obedience that is. Slaves of sin have obedience to offer, and they offer their obedience to sin. This is the opposite of that. This, is, this one is a slave with obedience to offer as well, and he offers his slave obedience to obedience, resulting in righteousness. This has to be obedience to God. And it's worded emphatically to, to put emphasis on this obedience under grace. If the other slave mentioned first is an obeyer, then this opposite slave is marked even more emphatically by obedience to God, a slave of obedience. What is the result of slaving to obedience to God? You might expect the opposite of death mentioned before, that this obedience to God results in or it expresses life, but that's not what he says. He said it expresses, proves righteousness. And this is a major point that must be made about grace. To be under grace results in righteousness. The gospel defending grace here is not telling you how to get saved out of the sinfulness of your slavery to sin. This is not declared righteousness. We know that as we've gone through Romans Grace achieved that declared righteousness, though, for us also, didn't it? Through faith alone, in Christ alone, it achieved it. And that righteousness there that comes through faith is actually God's righteousness, untainted righteousness, a righteousness that is eternal, that is ever secure, that can never be improved upon, it can never be diminished by us. But this righteousness here in verse 16 is not our positional righteousness before God through faith alone, without any works. This righteousness in verse 16 is our practical righteousness, our practice of righteousness that is connected to our obedience to God. This is sanctification. Sanctification. 
It is a righteousness that results from our slaving under obedience to God. Who is this slave? Well, let's go back to chapter 5 and walk through it again. Look at verse 15 of chapter 5. The grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounds to the many. The ones who are under grace. Verse 16, halfway through. On the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. There's our declared righteousness. Verse 17, halfway through. Those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So we're under the reign of grace and we are reigning in life through Jesus. Verse 18, halfway through the verse. Through the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Verse 19, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous or constituted, put into the category of righteousness. So where sin increased in that sinful slab of solidarity, verse 20, with Adam, grace abounded all the more, even though law came in and intensified the transgression. Who are these slaves? They are, verse 21, those who are under the reign of grace. So grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These are the ones who are under the reign of grace. So your Bible is telling you what it knows to be true about you. We are slaves, period. It doesn't say you you really should be a slave, you know. It just declares to us what we are. You are are slaves of the one whom you obey. And the dividing line between the two categories of slavery is grace as a force, as a power. It just declares to us what we are on either side. And how does that slavery work on either side? How does it come about? Well, grace is the dividing line. Grace is the achiever But how does it come about? Well, it happens very willingly on both sides. When you, not another, present yourself and not part of you as a slave for obedience. You, as a full-time slave, working triple overtime as a slave, you have obedience to offer to a master, and so you do what slaves do on either side. You offer yourself to a master. And what are the options? It's either or, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience to God resulting in righteousness. There is no third category. There is no independent party to join because you're skeptical of the two or uncertain about the other two slave parties that exist. You are not declared to be half of one slave type while simultaneously being half of the opposite slave type. You are actually, you are ultimately, you are finally either a slave of obeying sin or a slave obeying obedience to God. And when each one of us faces God one day, maybe even today, it will be as a slave, and it will be as one of these two slaves. Slaves of obedience to him are his slaves by his grace. And slaves obeying sin are not his. Why is this whole contrasting and clarifying of slave categories, why is this even happening at this point in Romans 6? The gospel's defense of grace is all about making this point. Grace as a force of power, it is not rivaled by law as a force of power. Why? Because law as a force can do nothing to change you It can do nothing to end your slavery to sin. It can do nothing to abolish your slavery to sin. In fact, law as a force of power, it only intensifies and strengthens your slave bondage to sin. Romans 5.20, while grace as a slave force and power, it saves. It saves. 
It separates, puts you into a new category, and signals you that a new slavery has begun. So then why would you put any confidence in law as a fuel, as a force, as a power to go against any sin here or any sin there in your life? Why? Don't you know how you went from being a slave of sin resulting in death to now being a slave of obedience resulting in a righteous lifestyle? Don't you know? It certainly didn't come by using law as a force or as a power in your life. Grace did this. And do you think grace will be powerless then when a believer faces this sin here or faces that sin there? Do you not know what grace has achieved? That believer is a slave now by grace with obedience to offer to God. The result will be righteous living, not sin. So grace in no way is rivaled by law's power in the fight against sin in the believer's life. That's what Romans 6, verse 15 and 16 say. The contrast and the clarification of the only two slave categories makes the point. Law as a force of power does nothing. It only makes it worse And grace ensures that obedience to God results in righteous living for the believer. And the two slave categories make it obvious that grace is not rivaled by law as a power at all, ever. There is no worry, there is no skepticism warranted about what will happen in the believer's life when faced with this sin or that sin there. Grace as a force, it says here, a force of power has achieved a new slavery for the believer that results in righteous living through obedience to God. The question is, which slave are you right now? And listen, on your own, you cannot move from one to the other. You cannot move back and forth between them. Listen, You cannot be a slave for a while over there in sin and then make some resolutions and decide to come over to this side and be a slave of obedience to God for a while and then move back over on your own. It's impossible to transfer from the first to the second. But you can, by grace, move from the first to the second from slavery to sin to slavery to obedience and do it once and for all. Once and for all. This is what it means by grace to become a Christian. Grace says don't use a set of rules or laws as a force to try to distinguish yourself or to try to merit attention from God. Grace commands you to not do that, but to instead believe Jesus Christ. He was crucified at the cross. He suffered the wrath of God there as a substitute in the place of all slaves of sin. Who will trust him? All your sins can be wiped away, can be forgiven through faith in his finished work at the cross. And he was raised from the dead too. And grace reveals that those who who have believed Jesus Christ, also grace unites them with Christ crucified, with Christ buried, with Christ raised from the dead. And what we're told is that changes you in the presence of sin. A changed slave status. It transfers you from one section to the other. You died to the old master's sin and you live to God, a new master. You are one or you are the other right now. The dividing line is grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, whom are you obeying? Sin or God? Believer, do you know what this tells you first of all? First, this explains how you can do anything that is right. (laughs) 
when you face any situation and a righteous action results, you know why. You now know why. Because it primarily, foundationally, had to do with grace. But with the achievement of the grace of God in your life, listen carefully, grace transformed you such that now you, by grace, offer yourself as a slave of obedience to God. You did not achieve the slave category, but you are a willing participant as a slave. You offer yourselves. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one you obey, of obedience resulting in righteousness? Grace transformed you. That results in righteous practice. How is it that anything good in your life is ever achieved in your thinking? How is it that you do anything that is right in your attitude or word or deed? How does that even ever come about? Well, grace put you into a new slave category with new equipping to present yourself to obedience. And with every obedience comes the opportunity for you, believer, to say, grace did that. Grace achieved that in my life. Grace made that possible. I'm a new slave. I'm a new slave. I'm not that old slave anymore. And grace transformed me and transferred my slavery to God. I'm actually now alive to God. And I just proved it because I presented myself to him as a slave for obedience. How did that happen? It's God in his grace. The reign of grace is powerful. We should probably slow down as believers and be a little more stunned by the fact that anything good happened in anything we do, ever. But that's probably not where you're struggling right now. What are we to think about, believer, our disobedience here? And our disobedience there as Christians. The sin that we commit as believers who have become by grace slaves of obedience to God. First of all, sin and disobedience in our lives as believers, it falls squarely on us. And never on grace, never. Sin is completely incongruent with grace and grace is completely incongruent with sin. Grace aims for and has achieved for us everything that is against sin. Listen, grace did not create for you a safe place in your Christian life to play with sin. Grace is not friendly towards sin that way. Grace is not for sin. Grace is not tolerant of sin. It has made no provision for sin. Romans 6.16 is worded precisely and carefully with such clarity and ultimacy that you can draw no conclusion that grace is okay with an occasional sin here or an occasional sin there. Grace doesn't allow for that. So that means the only one to blame when sin arises in this new life that we have in grace is ourselves. The reason we sin is not because grace is faulty towards sin, and it is not because grace is friendly towards sin. The reason we sin is simply because we present ourselves to it as slaves to obey. We become forgetful slaves. You ever wonder why the Lord Jesus thought it was important to tell his disciples, I'm going to give you a meal so that you would remember me. We are forgetful slaves. We forget. We are neglectful 
slaves. We are hypocritical slaves. We are treasonous slaves of obedience who willingly choose to do what is incongruent with grace here and sometimes there. And instead, we present ourselves to sin and we obey it. Grace tells us we are new and grace tells us that we have everything necessary for life and godliness. It is on the slave who forgets. It is on the slave who neglects. It is on the slave who doesn't believe what grace says it achieved. And, and could there be any more clear proof, believer, that sin has not changed in you than this? Remember, we've been saying you are not the same person toward the same sins, right? Grace changed you. But listen, sin is still the same toward the new you. Sin is still the same old master toward this, the new you. Because when was the last time you ever presented yourself as a slave to sin to obey it and it refused you? I'm really angry right now, and so I'm going to present myself as a slave with obedience to anger, and anger said, you know, thanks but no thanks. I've turned over a new leaf. When do we ever present ourselves to bitterness or to lust or to laziness or whatever the sin is, here or there? When do we ever do that and sin refuses us and says, look, I'm just going to get in any more trouble if you obey me, so no thanks. I actually have a conscience now, and I can't bear to see you cheat on grace with me anymore. No thanks, I'm tired of enslaving you. Sin is always a slave master and will always willingly accept your obedience and my obedience when we present ourselves as slaves to it. You have changed towards sin, believer. You have. You are not the same you in the presence of the same sins, but sin is the same master in the presence of the new you. And if you present yourself to sin, to obey it, it will not refuse you. It's on you and it's on me when we sin. So then what is your disobedience, believer? If these two ultimate categories are true and grace has nothing to do with this and grace does not prepare a little safe place for you to toy with your sin, if, if, if this is true, then what, what is, what is your, obe your disobedience? It is, for the true believer, it is temporary. And it is tragic. And your disobedience is treasonous. It is a treasonous betrayal of God. It is a foolish forgetting or denial of grace. It is a hideous sin of the worst kind because of what you know about sin, but even more so what you know about God in his grace towards you and what he's done and what he's achieved for you. And certainly this is where confession must begin when we sin, is it not? That we understand the, the gravity of what has happened. And listen, our disobedience here, our disobedience there is not automatically proof that we are still slaves to sin in the cement slab of sinful solidarity with Adam. The committing of a sin here or a committing of a sin there, which is absolutely tragic and which is actually full of all kinds of treasonous betrayal, is not automatically proof that you are still the old man who has not yet been crucified with Christ. But what each committing of a sin requires from a true believer is a self-imposed fork in the road. What did I just do? What did my obedience to sin just say? What did it just communicate? It said everything that is the opposite of what grace is and what grace has achieved in my life. What? As a slave, I presented myself for obedience to God's enemy? I betrayed my master and my Lord? 
I forgot, or I even worse, I denied briefly who I truly am by God's grace. Listen, every sin committed here or committed there is a fork in the road moment for the child under the reign of grace. It is to be taken seriously. Which way will I turn right, right now? What will I do? I must turn toward grace. By grace, I know what I'll do. I'll consider myself, I'll take it as a settled fact that I am dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus, verse 11. I know what I'll do. I'll trust this, that I cannot and I will not let sin reign in my mortal body so that I obey its lusts, verse 12. I know what I'll do. At the mind level, I will not go on presenting the members of my body to sin as weapons of unrighteousness, but instead I'll present the totality of myself, verse 13, to God as one who is alive from the dead. And I'll present my members, my portions as instruments of righteousness to God. I will trust in this categorical statement, sin shall not be master over me. Oh, Lord, I pray that that would be the case because of what you promise here that I am not under the force of law, but I am under the force of grace. You see, every sin committed here or there becomes a fork in the road moment. I rest again and again and again, and I declare to myself again and again and again what grace in its power has achieved for me and in me and with me. And when that kind of thing happens, when a believer becomes aware of sin here or there, there is no greater proof in that moment of the reign of grace in your life. When that kind of confession of sin comes and, and when that kind of repentance is begun, when that occurs, you may cry out in self-disgust, what a pitiful creature I am. But at that moment, your Savior and his kingly grace say, what a precious child, so tender over his sin against me. Listen, you need to understand this. One who is still in slavery to sin down in that slab of solidarity with Adam and everybody else, one who is still a slave to sin does not feel those kinds of things. One who is still a slave to sin does not think about those kinds of things to do when they sin. One who is still a slave to sin does not talk about these kinds of things. One is, one is still a slave to sin does not do these kinds of things. One who is still a slave to sin trivializes these kinds of things when they sin. Do you see the difference that grace makes? One under the reign of grace does think these things, feel this way, talk this way, do these kinds of things. What do you do when you become aware of your sin. Do you create a fork in the road moment for yourself? There was once a really, really bad sinner. His way of life was to make other men slaves. His name was John Newton. And then amazing grace saved his life I'm going to give you some thoughts from him as we close. He gave thought to this. What am I, why am I in this conundrum as a believer? What do I learn from this committing of a sin here and a committing of sin there when I am a slave of God to obedience? I, number one, he said, and I'm going to paraphrase him, I feel more acutely, I feel more clearly, deeply con completely my utter depravity and the corruption of my whole nature. If there is one who understands how wicked sin is, it is the believer. I feel more acutely and clearly and deeply, completely my utter depravity and corruption of my whole nature, that I'm defiled in every part, he said. Number two, what do I learn from this? 
I learned God's method of salvation is exceedingly endeared to me. It becomes sweeter and sweeter to me all the, all the way. My salvation must wholly be of God's grace. If any of this salvation depends upon me, I am lost. What do I learn? Thirdly, I see the power of God to keep me. I see the power of God to keep me to be immeasurably capable, exceedingly capable. My weaknesses, my temptations, my sins cannot undo ever his keeping power over me. The reigning power of grace is never undone, never dethroned by my foolishness. Every day is proof of that. What do I learn? Fourthly, Satan is shamed every day by God's grace in the gospel. Though he finds me to be so easily a conquest here in this sin and there in that sin, yet I still escape at last. He throws me to the dust. He wounds me. He sifts me like wheat. But my king and his grace raise me up again and again and again. He is shamed every day by God's grace. That's what I learn. What do I learn? Number five, I learn pity. I learn patience. I learn compassion for other believers, perhaps no other way than this way. I'm not hardened toward other believers who fall into their sin here or their sin there, but I'm moved to compassion and I become ever ready in compassion to help them. Being intimately aware of my own inward treason gives me a heart of compassion toward other sinning believers. I certainly do not think their sin is no big deal. But I have compassion towards them. I understand. And lastly, what do I learn? These are directly his words. I'll just read them to you. And lastly, I believe nothing more habitually reconciles me, a child of God, to the thought of death than the wearisomeness of this warfare. Death is unwelcome to nature, but then, and not till then, the conflict will cease. Then I shall sin no more. My flesh, with all its attendant evils, will be laid in the grave. Then my soul, which has been partaker of a new and heavenly birth, shall be freed from every encumbrance and stand perfect in the Redeemer's righteousness before God in glory. We are in a very interesting place as believers under the reign of grace. We are not what we were. What we are now is so much better than what we were. But we are not yet what we will be. And this is a pitiful condition compared to what we will be. Let's pray. Father, again, we rely upon your grace in our lives. We remember Jesus Christ crucified for our sins. How tender was he toward us to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What do we even say except we thank you and we love you. Father, would you make in us your children, would you make us more sensitive to how hideous our sin is against you? And may grace abound in our lives by helping us to confess thoroughly and to present ourselves once again as slaves of obedience to you. We desire righteousness in the way that we live. You have provided everything for us by your grace. Fortify us against forgetfulness. Fortify us against being neglectful. And Lord, we marvel at your grasp over us, your hand that keeps us. Thank you. You will not go back on your word, though we do on ours cast ourselves upon you again. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.